Well, good morning. I welcome you to worship this morning. Um, I notice that I have the gathering hymn before the confession and forgiveness. And so I guess that's the order we'll do it in. <laughs> so well, welcome this morning. It is the Father's Day morning and uh, another Sunday in Pentecost. And today we'll be talking about faith like a mustard seed. And we'll see where that text takes us. I invite you now to please stand and join us in the gathering hymn. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead to sin and made us alive together with Christ. 
By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with the power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the tree of life, offering shelter to all the world. Graft us into yourself and nurture our growth, that we may bear your truth and love to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from the book of Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, 
I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of a cedar. I will set it out. I will break off a tender one from the topmost of its young twigs. I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it in order that it may produce boughs of bear and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Under it, every kind of bird will live. In the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. All the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree. I make high the low tree. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will accomplish it. The word of the Lord. It is a good thing to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High. On the psaltery and on the to the melody of the harp. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree and shall spread abroad like a cedar of Lebanon. The Gospel according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as someone who scatters seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain of, in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up to become the greatest of all shrubs, and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air may nest and may make nests in its shade. With many such parables he spoke the word to them. As they were able to hear it, he did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you be seated. Oh, we'll have a time for children's time. If there's any kids, they want to come forward. Well, today I'm just going to read you the story. It's called The Parable of the Mustard Seed. 
right. Take this out so you can see it. All right. Hmm. Jesus said one day to a crowd of listeners, he tapped his chin, how can I describe the family of God to you? Aha. God's family is like a mustard seed. But mustard seeds are tiny, the crowd exclaimed. And Jesus scooped some round black seeds from the ground and rolled them on his palm. When they grow, the mustard seeds turn into the largest, strongest plants around. Even birds put nests in their branches. The crowd was staring to nod, starting to nod. They were getting it. It starts small, but the tiny seed grows into something great. He stepped back to show the full-grown mustard bush as tall as two people. Really tall. God's family may have started out small, but each time someone shows or tells others about the love of God, it grows and it grows. So how would you describe God's family? It may be small in the beginning, one little story, talking to another person, telling them about what God means for you, and it grows and grows just by doing that, and it comes bigger and bigger, just like this mustard seed that's just teeny, teeny, tiny. I don't, I don't even know anything that would... I could, it's just teeny, tiny. There's... Yeah, like that. Just teeny tiny. I can't even see. Yeah. And then it grows into this big, big bush. Yeah, it's really tiny. And that's like God's family. We grow in this family. So this is God's family. You're all in God's family. And when you share about what God means to you, you invite other people to be in the family. So that's our story. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for welcoming us into your family. May we welcome others to your family as well. Amen. Thanks. In today's story, Jesus talks about parables. He says, what parable shall I tell? And a parable is a teaching tool. Uh, it basically was a story that presents a dilemma for us to grapple with. And generally, they were supposed to have some shock value to them. So the kingdom of God is like planting a small, tiny mustard seed that grows into a great bush that shelters the birds of the air. Is that shocking? Is anyone shocked? Are you grappling with anything? Well, have you ever seen a mustard bush? Let's see if I got a picture. Does it come up? Do we have it? We don't have it. Okay. Well, a mustard bush, so there's teeny, 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 tiny seed, um, plant grows into this bush that, if you look in our entryway right here, you know how it curves? If you just kind of turn around and you see the doors, the stained glass window, and how it curves. Okay, that's about how tall that thing can grow and about how wide, and it's just a mixed up bramble of brambles, just bushy. It's just all tangled and mixed, and it's about that big. A man standing next to it is, you know, about standing next to that door the size you would be, and it'd be that much taller than you. 
A mustard bush is an out-of-the-control, pungent weed that you would never intentionally plant, or rarely would. In fact, ancient Greek and Jewish gardening manuals said that mustard must be kept separate from other plants because it took over the garden. There you go. Found it. Nothing's, look at that. Imagine that little seed falling in your garden. There'd be no garden left. Just be that. It can grow to a height of six feet or more, as you can see. It's aggressive. It's an invasive weed. It's kind of like kudza or creeping Charlie or some of those. It takes over where it is not wanted. It gets out of control. It attracts birds into areas being cultivated where you don't want birds to be coming into, right? It's the opposite of a scarecrow. It's a, it's a bird attractor, not detractor. So Jesus is saying that God's rule is like an idiot planting weeds in a, that are in a, in a place where you don't want them, and not just any weed, but the most invasive, impossible to remove, prolific beyond measure, taking over the whole garden and providing a home for birds that you don't want in that garden, weed. Now do you feel a little bit to grapple with or a shock value. Someone once said that a weed is just a flower who is a victim of prejudice. Well, weeds are plants, and they're usually a plant that grows eagerly. And it grows with great ease. And it's often unwanted where it grows. It's out of good order. I remember an example of this when I was a kid, and one of my jobs was to walk the bean field. So you'd walk up and down the rows of the bean field with a hoe, and you would hoe out or pull the weeds that were growing in the bean field, and you'd clean the fields. Well, one of the weeds in the field was corn stalks because of uh, balancing of the nutrition in the soil. It's very good to have corn planted the year before you plant beans because each one gives and takes nitrogen into the, oil, into the soil. And so, generally, you would always have these random corn stalks growing in your bean field. And they look ugly from the road. <laughs> so Dad would always want those knocked out first. <laughs> and so, I would think, wow, this, this was our crop last year, and this year, it's a weed I've got to pull. Maybe weeds are just a matter of perspective. From what I've come to know about God's ways, being asked to live in a weeds-ruled world of life does make sense. God's wisdom tends to dwell in layer upon layer of a kind of absurdity, finding blessing where we'd least expect Blessing God being an extravagant giver of grace, often to those that we would judge undeserving. We didn't earn it. Why did you give him grace, God? God, again and again, chooses the youngest or the weakest or the lowest or the poorest to be the one that becomes the greatest among kings or the greatest among prophets or, or even Jesus, born in poverty. 
God has a tendency to think outside our nice God boxes. So while we expect God to be remote, dignified, rational, predictable, what we get in our God, our God is wild and extravagant and uncontrollable experience of a personal creator. Not, oh, I'll pop you out there and good luck. Uh uh, a personal creator, a radical savior, and an irrational spirit. That is our Trinity. A God that won't fit in our God boxes, our boxes of judgment and predictability and perfection. And that's an unsettling thought. Because deep down, we all hold this innate desire to control. An innate fear of letting go of control. Which is mostly illusion to begin with, but we still like to hang on to that idea that we have control. That we can plan and plant the perfect garden life but we can't control the frost, or the drought, or the fire, or the rabbits from invading and disrupting your perfect garden life, no matter how well you planned it. Nor do we win the battle against the invasive weeds. They have plans of their own. So could it be that living a life in God's rule means that we don't have control over how perfect our life is going to look to the rest of the world? And it may mean that we might even look like a cornstalk in the middle of a bean field, a little out of place, a little uncomfortable. An aspect of this parable and of its challenge is the, the sense of control. Um, but there's, an, there's another the, that usually gets highlighted, and it was what I talked about in the children's service, about smallness, that in small things can come great things with the littlest steps, the littlest hopes, Progressing on a path, it can lead to great hope. This parable can be understood as a testimony of the power of our focus. Where do you place your focus? Even the smallest bit of focus on that littlest thing can mean the difference of what kind of weed invasive weed you grow. For there are insignificant little things that we can focus on that are not faith building. See, we can worry and we can stress out and we can fill our minds and our hearts with anxiety and frustration and fears of failure And then we open ourselves to be changed in ways that hold us back and keep us from experiencing an abundant grace of God and all that that offers. It's like being trapped inside of that bush. Now imagine flipping that focus putting the tiniest attempt into prayer about that fear, about that stressing out situation, about that fear of failure. Just that little flip. What would that tiny seed plant? Plant. 
planting a seed of hope. Even though things look absolutely hopeless. And you're really not sure if good could possibly come from the bad that is happening or you're living. It's that tiny seed of a weed, of a prayer in that direction. Imagine it covered with cemented perfectionism, estrangement from God, loneliness, addiction, grief, worry. And then let it be, like the beginning of our parable. Farmer plants the seed, does not know how it grows and it comes to be, but that it sure does, and then he goes out and harvests it. Just let it be. Let that hope be. And that little hopeful weed finds its way to grow through the tiniest little crack that it finds in that cement of perfectionism because it really wasn't that perfect because it can't be. And then this uncontrolled growth, passion beyond common sense, invasive love and grace for you and for me, pushing through, coming forward, Your personal creator, seeing the pain of her creation, paying the debt himself. Imagine that tiny seed of faith leaving a pile of broken cement at the foot of the cross. It's shocking to think of God's rule being like an invasive weed. The traditional thought is found more often in what we read in our text from Ezekiel. The kingdom of God is like a mighty cedar tree. Yes. Here I stand. Not what we expect. We want the strong, we want the tall, mighty God that we can depend on and swing our swing and enjoy our days and have everything's glory, glory. But here's a thought. How do you get rid of a cedar tree? Well, you cut it down. Cedar trees easily fall. And they never regrow from their stump. Now, how do you get rid of a weed? Well, you can... Shoot it with some weed be gone, and you got rid of it for maybe a year. But guess what? It's back next year. And it comes back again and again. Cut it, pull it, poison it. It comes back. It keeps coming back. And that gives me comfort. Because Jesus may not be offering a life of mighty power and greatness like the cedar. But Jesus is offering a life that lasts and keeps coming back. No matter what we do to keep God out. Always there. He's a God of forgiveness, of love, of shelter, of shade. And maybe sometimes ethical irritation (laughs) and consciousness. A God who shelters when we are tired and weary in our lives. So when we feel willing to surrender and take a rest from being in control from trying to create the perfect garden. Consider the words of assurance given by the one who said God's kingdom is like an invasive weed that will not go away. That person said, Come, all ye who are weary, and I shall give you rest. And I will not abandon you. Amen.
Join me in the Father's Day litany for fathers everywhere who have given us life and love that we may show them respect and love. For fathers who have lost a child through death, that their faith may give them hope and their family and friends support and console them. For men who may or may not have children of their own, but act like a father to someone in need of advice, support, nurturing, and love. For stepfathers who have assumed that role with love and joy, who have loved the children of another as their own and created a new family. For adopted fathers who have heard the call of God to lovingly step forward for those that need their care. For fathers who have been unable to be a source of strength, who have not responded to the needs of their children and have not sustained their families. For fathers who struggle with temptation, violence, or addiction. For those who do harm and for those whom they have harmed. For new fathers, full of hope. For longtime fathers, full of wisdom. For the fathers yet to be, and fathers soon to be. For those that have shaped our lives without claim of family or kinship. For those who have taught us, guided us, shaped us, and molded us into servants of Christ our Lord. Filled with the Holy Spirit, we join with the church in every place, praying for the world that God so loves. O Most High, your divine realm is like a noble tree, whose boughs and branches give shade and rest to the peoples of the earth. Make your church a nesting place for all who need your peace and healing. Hear us, O God. O Most High, all the world is a garden for your creativity. Refresh places of drought with abundant rains. Strengthen and keep safe those who fight fires in your forest. Help us tend your mountains and plains, oceans and rivers with loving care. Hear us, O God. O Most High, you speak and your word is accomplished. Speak to the leaders of the nation so that they might end cycles of violence giving people everywhere tranquility and peace. Hear us, O God. O Most High, if anyone is in Christ, there is new creation. Bring the abundant healing blessings of the new creation into the lives of those who suffer illness or deprivation of any kind, especially Elda, John, Steve, Rosemary, Heidi, Paul, and Valerie. Hear us, O God. O oh, Most High, your steadfast love and faithfulness sustain your people. Bless fathers and all father figures with such love and faithfulness that children flourish and grow in uprightness and joy. Bless those who long to be fathers and for those whom this day is difficult. Hear us, O oh God. O oh, Most High, just as the earth produces of itself and the harvest comes, you gather up people from at all times and all places. Bring us along with those who have died into the lasting harvest of your kingdom. Hear us, O oh God. O oh God, we lift up prayers of sympathy for the friends and family of Elda Mickelson. Lord, by your sure guidance of your Holy Spirit, O oh God, we lift up our prayers in trust and thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Also with you. Please take this time to share the peace with one another.
hand and satisfy the need of every living thing. You have set this feast before us. Open our hands to receive it. Open our hearts to embrace it. Open our lives to live it. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. O God most mighty, O God most merciful, O God our rock and our salvation, hear us as we praise, call us by your table, grant us your life. When the world was a formless void, you formed order and beauty. When Abraham and Sarah were barren, you sent them a son. When the Israelites were enslaved, you led them to freedom. Ruth faced starvation, David fought Goliath, and the psalmist cried out for healing, and full of compassion you granted your people your life. You entered our sorrows in Jesus, our brother. He was born among the poor. He lived under oppression. He wept for the city. With infinite love, he granted the people your life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his death, we cry out, Amen. Celebrating his resurrection, we shout, Amen. Trusting his presence in every time and place, we plead, Amen. O God, you are breath. Send your spirit on this meal. O God, you are bread. Feed us with yourself. O God, you are wine. Warm our hearts and make us one. O God, you are fire. Transform us with your hope. O God, most majestic. O God, most motherly. O God, our strength and our song. You show us a vision of a tree of life with fruits for all and leaves that heal the nations. Grant us such faith, the life of the Father to the Son, and the life of the Spirit to our risen Savior. Life in you, now and ever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom.
Come, let us eat. The feast is now spread. You may be seated. All are welcome to receive this meal of forgiveness. The ushers will let you know when to come forward. We'll commune on either railing. You may kneel or stand as you are able. You'll receive the bread and then either dark liquid, which is wine, or light liquid, which is grape juice, and there are gluten-free elements available. Just let your server know. Come, let us eat.
invite you to stand and receive the blessing, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Jesus Christ, host of this meal, you have given us not only this bread and this cup, but your very self, that we may feast on your great love. Filled again by these signs of your grace, may we hunger for your reign of justice. May we thirst for your way of peace. For you are Lord forevermore. And call, you can have a seat. Call your attention to announcements. Please read through the messenger. There's a lot going on this week. Um, and I know we have an announcement over here. Do you, I'll grab you the mic. Should, I'm reporting for the call committee. I want you to know we are in ongoing communication with the Senate office, and they forward information to us. We have conducted an initial review, interview with one candidate, and on this Tuesday, we will be looking at the profile of another candidate that we've received. Our primary consideration as the call committee is that we look at the questions and the suggestions from the reports that you filled out, and this is the minister that we want to find who fulfills our ministry needs. And finally, I want to call your attention You'll see a call to prayer from the call committee in your messenger and in your midweek reminder. We sincerely ask that you pray for the call committee as we consider these people. We also ask that you pray that that pastor is out there, will be receptive to the call. I'll remind you that we had the ministry site profile, and there's still a stack of them in the back, if you want to look, that your call committee filled out. And this is what the candidates will be responding to. If you have any questions, I'll be around. Oh, one more. I wondered if you were going to <laughs> Real quick, this mo oh, are we off? We should be on. Okay, oh, there we are. Um, we have gotten some really great donations over at the Messiah House. I'll be there until noon today if anybody has anything that they need to drop by. Next Sunday we'll have an open house and we'll have coffee and lemonade and cookies and we'd like for you to come through and take a look and see what the ladies are going to have. There's been three ladies selected and they, we got the cream of the crop. They're the best and they are so thankful for having the opportunity to have a house to actually live in. So uh, thank you everybody so much and bring things today until noon, contact us. There's numbers in the messenger if you need to bring things at another time and then come and see the house on uh, next Sunday. And thank you everybody that's helped to work. There's been so many people that have been over there helping. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, just a brief announcement. In a month or so, we're going to have a fish fry and a jello thon. So there's a sign up sheet out back. If you can help catch some fish, that'd be great. If you want to help cook or set up or whatever, there's, it's a sign up sheet. Please uh, see what you can do and have, let's have some fun and have a fish fry. Okay. Any other? Um, I will call for the. Women of the ELCA, there's a, a cluster gathering next Saturday. It's kind of an impromptu. It's out of the order of things um, that happen sometimes. Clusters 8 and 9 at Peace Lutheran in Joplin. They have a special speaker and a lunch, and they're asking for RSVPs by June 20th. They really encourage uh, going to that. It looks like a very fun event, and they're very excited to host the women of Area 8 and 9 clusters, um, which covers quite a, quite a span of area. That would be all of southwest Missouri, southeast Kansas, up into the middle west Missouri, middle west east Kansas area. So you can meet some new neighbors. 
Other things I think you can read along, uh, Vacation Bible School starts tonight, so I wanted to do a blessing prayer for them. So I'd ask all of the, um, all of the volunteers that are working with uh, VBS, if you're teaching or signing people in or shepherding or anything like that, and any of the kids that are here that are coming to VBS, if you just stand up where you are and we'll do this prayer. Let us pray. Abundant and energetic God, you fill our world with a season of summer delights, sunshine, warm breezes, a slower pace to enjoy your creation. Fill us with the joy of this season. We gather around your word in the midst of our summer, and may our days together lead to new friendships, new activities, new insights, and a strengthened relationship with you. May your spirit shower upon these teachers, leaders, and volunteers, giving energy, creativity, and patience. May your love embrace the children and young people who join us for Bible school so they may come to know you more deeply. May your people experience good fellowship in these days as we study, create, and play. Bless us, O oh God, as we seek to learn from your word and to share your love as we gather as um, in your, in, as, we get, as you gather us in your summer Bible school, send us out beyond this place to show the world that we have come to know that your grace and welcome and wonder are for all. So we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. One other announcement. Um, so in the next couple weeks, uh, I will be kind of in and out. It just happens that a lot of the ELCA responsibilities that I have fell in the same four weeks. And so last week I had uh, Synod Assembly, and so on Saturday night, John Figuera filled in, and then he gave the sermon last Sunday. Next Sunday, I have National Association for Interim Pastors Conference, and so John Figueroa will be filling in on Saturday night because I'll roll in about 8 o'clock again, and, um, and he'll just preach the sermon on next Sunday. So <laughs> that will be what's happening next Sunday. And then uh, the Sunday after that, I will be leaving for Colorado. I've been invited by the Rocky Mountain Synod to be a guest theologian for a week at camp. And so I will be at camp all week in Colorado. And so the Sunday of the 29th and 1st and the 7th and 8th, I will be on the road those two weekends. And you will have a, um, uh, the first weekend will be a um, PMA, Parish Ministry Assistant from Peace, uh, Lutheran, Prince of Peace Lutheran, that will be here, and the weekend after that um, will be John Spigero leading. Um, that will be the, the blended service, worship service. So um, that's what's going on. So you won't see me too much on the weekends for the next three or four, three weekends. Um, and then I'll be back. So um, just to give you a heads up on that. All right. Let us receive the benediction. I arise today through a mighty strength. Christ in me, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me. Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in the eye of everyone who sees me, Christ in the ear of everyone who listens to me. I arise today through a mighty strength, the power of the three-in-one, Creator, Spirit, and Christ. Amen. Guided by the Gospel, we welcome all to worship, make disciples, learn ministry, contribute, gather resources for our ministries. Go in peace. The Spirit sends us forth to serve. Thanks be to God. Thank mm -hmm. you.